Welcome to ETT Turns 1, where we will take a look at the progress the program has achieved in its first year. The ETP was announced on the 25th of October 2010. In a year, we've had much progress and have compiled a short video profiling some of our project donors. The Economic Transformation Programme was designed to meet the need to propel Malaysia into a developed nation status by 2020. Since inception on 25th October 2010, the ETP has made progress in leaps and bounds. 70 entry point projects have kick-started with 171 billion ringgit in committed investments. 83% of the projects announced are operational or have commenced. As at June, the GNI contribution from the ETP is 288 billion ringgit, 58% of our full year target. The ETP is on track to deliver its targets. The Education NKEA aims to rebrand Malaysia as a hub in the global education network. Amongst the initiatives under this NKEA is EduCity, a 395-acre integrated best-in-class education hub located in Nusa Jaya, Johor, Marlborough College, Nottingham University and Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia are just a few of the international institutions that have set up here. We are currently developing the region's first multi-varsity education hub. The Newcastle campus opened up for classes in September. Netherlands Maritime Institute of Technology has also started conducting classes. Newcastle has been the pioneer in EduCity and we're very happy to see that they have created the impact that we have expected in terms of creating job opportunities and creating demand for services, catering, supply, security through the EPP uh, program helps to create awareness for Iskandar Malaysia at the micro level and at micro level generates interest from other potential partners. We view EduCity as a very vibrant hub as a centre for knowledge gain or the creation of intellectual property which will benefit both Malaysia as well as the region. The Healthcare NKEA represents another powerful engine of growth, aiming to capitalise on sectors from healthcare travel to biopharmaceutical manufacturing. General Electric was a participant in the Healthcare NKEA lab, where it first proposed the concept of the Diagnostic Services Nexus. We will link up all the radiologists, expertise in the country, irrespective of where they are, into a central hub. Our radiologists are all regulated by the Ministry of Health, so quality is there, control is there. This is a true public-private partnership. The government is very much a partner in ESN. That is a success factor for each of you. By the end of 2013, we'll be more than ready to go out to the international market. This NKEA targets to move Malaysia from agriculture to agribusiness capitalising on Malaysia's natural competitive advantages. One such company to help us achieve this target is Nova Laboratories. Nova Laboratories conducts research, development and clinical tests to develop high-value herbal products and commercialise them to a global market. With the help of ETP, Nova managed to actually be recognised as Malaysia's leader in herbal products. It also speed up most of the research being done makes things easier for us in terms of the meetings with the CRC, which are the clinical research centres, offices, and also the ethical committee, which will create about 730 new jobs by 2017. And our GNI, NOVA, will contribute alone about 198 million ringgit by the year 2020. The Communications Content and Infrastructure, NKEA, will expedite growth in the sector, moving from infrastructure towards applications and content. Smart Tag Solutions Berhad is amongst the project owners supporting this initiative. Smart Tag Security and Trade Facilitation, using RFID technology system, tracks containers entering, leaving and moving within the country. And the best part of the whole entire thing, we got involved with the EPP. Since then, we have went leap and bounce. Via ATP, we have been able to make greater networking with people, provide us the facilitation to deal with government agency. Royal Machine Custom have allowed us to uh, implement this at all their custom checkpoints, which amount to about nearly 900 over. People like DHL and DNT, they, they told us that they have cost saving on top of this. They have saved about 47 minutes per container, so it makes things even more faster. The Business Services, NKEA, targets to significantly raise the sector's contribution to the economy by 2020. CSF is one of the players that will contribute towards this goal by making Malaysia a global data centre hub. 
Data centers are essentially uh, building blocks of ICT that is uh, essential for the country's growth towards becoming a knowledge-based economy. Well, we are part and parcel of the EPP3 of the ETP and our role in that is the provision to create this data center space as the preferred outsourcing location for Malaysia uh, to the rest of the world. CX5, our latest computer exchange, when it's completed, it should be the largest carrier neutral data center in Southeast Asia. From Tukar to Pakar, and from Maidin to the Country Heights Group, the wholesale retail NKEA aims to increase the importance of retail as a driver of domestic consumption. The Minds Wellness City is a project by Country Heights Burhad to integrate healthcare, tourism, and targeted retail into a single development. Minds Resort City is now slowly transforming into what we are calling Minds Wellness City. So for ETP, we have recently launched also our first wellness project under our wellness zone, which is the Golden Horses Health Sanctuary. This is a holistic health screening um, hub and with the whole wellness concept that we will be pursuing in the next 10 to 15 years, we see a combined investment of up to 3.2 billion ringgit, which will uh, bring us to an expe expected GNI of 5.1 billion ringgit. There has been significant progress in the implementation of the ETP over the past year. The ETP is on track. Of the 171 billion ringgit investment committed, 9% or approximately 15 billion ringgit is slated for 2011. Of that amount, 64% has been realized, some 10 billion ringgit. The balance is scheduled to be realized by the year's end. Whilst we have a long way to go, Malaysia is moving at a rapid pace. We have put into place the building blocks to make Malaysia more competitive and to catalyze growth that will take us to 2020 and beyond. Without, without further ado, let me invite Datu Sri Idris Jala, CEO of Pumandu and Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, up onto stage to take us through the ETP's implementation in action. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is actually a quite an unusual uh, methodology that the comms people in my team suggest that we do, that we, we put this on, on live streaming. So and I do like to welcome uh, the folks that are following us on live streaming. And also, we got this on Twitter. So we've not done this before. It's the first time we're doing it. And we will see whether we have much better reach out. So there's a small group of us inside here. And hopefully, a lot more people are connected via live streaming and also Twitter. And a couple of slides I want to take you through. As we've shown in the six-minute video, the Prime Minister has launched the ETP on the 25th of October. It's a bit more than a year now since we've been uh, uh, implementing this. The progress is very encouraging by way of uh, the investments, the gross national income, and also jobs that we are creating. Uh, Malaysia's global ranking in various uh, indicators have improved too. When we looked at countries that have successfully made it from middle income to high income, there were clearly two key success factors. In our view, not three, but two. And the two has to do with focus. If you try to be a champion and good in everything, chances are you become quite average. You're not going to make it because growing from low income to middle income as a country is relatively simple you can grow at 10 percent. That's quite simple. We used to do 10 percent growth. Many countries do that, moving from low to middle. But the experience in many countries that are at the middle income, trying to make the step into a high income is very tough because the competition is stiff there. And so, therefore, to make it, you have to identify the areas of focus. And so the focus, the term that we use is the national key economic areas are the 12 areas of focus. So that's where we are going to really put our attention on so that we will focus in those areas. The second key success factor is on competitiveness. We have to create the conditions, the conditions so that companies operating in Malaysia or Malaysian companies will be so competitive that they will win it out by selling their product and services beyond our shores and in particular. So this chart here describes, if you like, in one slide, 
the whole thing around the ETP. So if you have difficulty following and reading the 600 page document, this is that one slide. So the objective clearly on this slide, if you return to it, is about the gross national income, that we need to grow our total GNI so that by the year 2020, our gross national uh, income reaches 1.7 trillion ringgit. And that is for us, so that when you think about a total population of about 31.6 uh, million people by 2020, that will give us US dollars 15,000, which is the minimum uh, threshold uh, to define a country that reaches a high income status. And on an average, we think that if we were to do this, we need to grow our GDP on an average around 6%. And secondly, when you grow the GNI, it's important to have jobs because it's the jobs that make sure that the money goes into the pocket of the people. And so the work under the ETP suggests that by the year 2020, we'll create 3.3 million jobs. And the total investment required, because investment is the leading indicator for GNI growth and job creation. So we need to make sure there's enough investment. And our projection is 1.4 trillion ringgit of cumulative investment between now and the year 2020 uh, needs to be had. And the bulk of that is coming out from the private sector. When I des describe private sector, our description here includes government-linked company. Eh? And, but in our document, it was quite clear how much of the 92% is private-private, if you like, and how much of that is GLC. Only 8% is public investment. And so, and again, the, the bulk of that is uh, domestic rather than FDI. I return then to the question about the transformational actions. We have to make sure that the transformational actions are in those two buckets I described, competitiveness, which are the 51 policy strategic reform initiatives, and also the focus areas under the NKEAs. Let me pay tribute to the work that has been done by the National Economic Action Council, led by Tansri Amisham. They spent a long time putting forward what was called then the new economic model, part one and the concluding part. In the concluding part, they came up with 51 policy measures that we needed to put in place so that we create the condition for competitiveness to exist in our economy. And so those are the things that we're implementing today. Next slide. As you know, since the 25th of October, we have had regular updates where the Prime Minister, together with the private sectors that are, have committed their investment in some of these projects, they come forward and then declare and make commitments. We have had seven of such updates led by the Prime Minister. Those are the dates. And altogether, we added it, the total committed investment come to the tune of 171 billion ringgit. The total committed GNI is 229 billion ringgit, and of which 131 entry point projects were identified uh, for us to run all the way until 2020. And already out of the 131, 70 of the entry point projects have begun. And so the total number of jobs that we feel will be created when those projects are finished and completed it will be 372,000 over jobs. And out of the 131 entry point projects that I described, uh, 70 of them are off the ground. You can see here, 31% with just 30 of those projects are already operational. You saw some of the slides earlier on the ones uh, being built, uh, and they also 52% of them have commenced, and 17 of them percent of them are in work in progress. And the slide that you've seen on the video also showed that of the 171 billion ringgit of committed investment, altogether for this year alone, realized this year, is uh, 10 billion ringgit. For this month and next month, is two more months, we expect that another five will be realized. That means 15 billion ringgit out of the 171 billion ringgit will be realized this year. But of course, I want to pause and say, the whole of the investment universe in Malaysia is not just made out of ETP. There are many existing investments that constitute the total investment universe within Malaysia. I'll come with that number later. Next. 
Let me pause for a moment and then put a check against our true north. True north will be, where are we heading? Our true north is, we've said, by the year 2020, our GNI needs to reach 1.7 trillion ringgit. We've got 10 years to get there. In the first 12 months of execution and implementation, the total committed GNI comes to 229 billion ringgit. And that's 13% of the 10-year target. And that's pretty good in far, as far as, as I'm concerned. In terms of investment, uh, we've said cumulative investment between now and the year 2020 is 1.4 trillion ringgit. Already the committed investment is already counting up to 171 billion. That's 12% of our 10-year target. That's also quite good as a start. In terms of jobs, we said by the year 2020, we need to create 3.3 million jobs. Already based on the committed projects, 372,000 jobs will be created when all of the projects that you've seen on the video that already have been announced when they are completed. And so that's the number, and that's 11%. So all in all, when you look at the 10-year target, we are on track. That's why we're saying that things are looking okay but we have to stay the course, and this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Let me now pause for a moment and deal with a question of what's happening with our economy, uh, looking at those same numbers, which are the GNI, jobs and investment with regards to what has been realized in the first half of this year, just for the first half of this year. Our target in terms of GNI for this year is 494 billion ringgit, for the first half of this year, the total GNI that has been realized, this is the DOS numbers, DOS, Department of Stats, 288 billion. So we are 58% of the annual target for this year. So that's pretty good. So 50 is the borderline mark. Lah. So if you're above 40 line, you're okay. The other one is the, uh, the target that we set out. You can look inside our, our uh, Target, the target for this year is 83 billion investment, which is private investment. And so for the next, the 10 Malaysia plan, if you look at it, on an average, it's 115 billion ringgit for five years. But it grows from starting this year in the, in the 10 Malaysia plan, 83 billion, and it rises on an average is 115. But this year's target is a private sector investment of 83 billion, so the total realized investment that has been uh, uh, put in into the economy is 51.2 billion. That is 62% of our target, and that's very good too. Jobs. Our job uh, target for this year is 684,000 jobs. That's a target that we wanted to create. And we have 344,000 jobs. These numbers, DOS have told me that they need to verify the numbers. So I put our, a health caution on these numbers they need to check it. They were very difficult to count jobs in and out because they move between sectors, so it's not an easy thing uh, to do here. And so if that number is correct, it's about 50%. I would say on the whole, if you look at our targets, GNI is true north for us, investment is true north, and jobs true north. So I think we are hitting all of them uh, just about. Now, if you look at the first half of the year GDP growth, it is not as rosy as we would like it. That's 4.4% growth rather than the average 6%. Last year, we grew at around 7.5%. And if we grow at 4.4%, let's say, in a, for the, the, the remaining second half of the year, if it's 5%, if it grows at 5%, we grew last year at 7%. So that means we still achieve the average over two year period of a 6%. That said, the most important point that we have to look at here is the GNI numbers, the job numbers, and the investment numbers. So the 6% is the guiding principle that if we get that on an average, we need to hit our true north numbers. The GNI is the measure. Clearly, the jobs is the measure. The total investment is the driver. Let me now look at what is happening with our private investment in the first half of this year rel relative to the first half of last year. And this has grown by 23.4%. So you can see some positive vibes in terms of 
really getting more private investment coming into the economy. Next one. Uh, this is another way to look at the 83 billion. So I said out of the 83 billion target investment for this year, 51.2 billion is realized already on the ground. Now if you take that and see how much of that is ETP related, for those that are pure and wanting to know the numbers, 10 billion of that is realized from the EPP project, 5 billion is to be realized. So that's for the second half of the, the year. Then with regards to the remaining, 41.2 billion is from what we call base load investments. Investments that were going to happen anyway and they did not need government assist assistance, they were going to do that. Some of you may recall, I wrote letters to all the big and medium scale companies in November uh, last year and the letter was, how much are you going to invest in the year 2011? And so altogether we have 1,700 replies from all the companies that we sent the letters to. In fact, my team made up something like 7,000 uh, you know, phone calls to ask people. At that time, the total amount of money they said that they would invest this year was 50 billion ringgit. And so, and in fact, I do have a list of all those companies, in including those that are intending to spend 50,000 ringgit for this year to buy a fax machine, I put that Those who are going to spend uh, 1 billion, also we have. 100 million, also we have. So the list is there. And so based on that base load investment, that constitute, it, it, based on our return, 50 billion. And so clearly already in the first half of this year, the 51 billion in the first half of the year already surpassed the original number that was given. That said, it was 1,700 return from companies that replied. So I feel very encouraged. Now, a lot of people have criticized the ETP for being very much project related. Let me say the ETP is not just project related, it's about structural reform initiatives. So SRI. The reason why Pemandu didn't spend a lot of effort on the SRI was because Tansri Amisham and the NEAC have been working very hard to identify what are those structural reform initiatives. We are implementing all of those 51 structural reform initiatives. Some of them are progressing better and faster than others, and some of them are going through. And essentially, there are six subgroups for all those 51. Let me start with international standards in liberalization. Remember always, I've said before, the SRI are there to create the conditions for competitiveness to flourish in our economy. So we need to liberalize. That will bring in competition. We need to introduce anti-competition law, and so under, under liberalization and standards. You have public finance. We have public service delivery. We have human capital development. There are nine policies there. We have government role in business, narrowing disparities, and boomy SMEs. So these are the SRIs that we're tracking. Let me cover some of the top, the key highlights on competition and liberalization. First of all, the Competition Act, we have passed. Uh, this has passed to be implemented in in January this year. So on the 1st of January, the competition law will come into force. That means it will prohibit anti-competitive behavior, bid rigging, and price fixing, monopolies, are no-no under this new regime, unless, of course, there are exclusions, which pertains to very specific uh, utility type of uh, uh, businesses. And so the Malaysia Competition Commission is already set up to ensure that this is enforced starting January. 17 services subsectors were announced by the Prime Minister recently, and up to 100% foreign equity participation will be allowed in phases starting from 2012. And these are some of the areas that we've begun to liberalize in uh, private hospital services, medical and dental specialist services. Uh, we have also on agricultural engineering, accounting and taxation and legal services career and telecom services, education and training services. Again, to make sure that we bring in much more competition into the local market so that our standards will increase. 
And we have also looked at public finance. In the NESC report, the concluding part, they said we have to make sure expenditure control in the government is improved so that we create then the space, which is called the fiscal space for the economy to then grow. So we've done, for example, much more transparent procurement is a recommendation to enhance and widen the scope of e-bidding. It's an example of something that's already happened. We've reduced the threshold for e-bidding from 200,000 to 50,000 so that you can go and do e-bidding directly online. And that will give us an additional savings. By this, we've seen about 20 million this year alone by just that particular activity that we've reduced the threshold from 200,000 to 50K. And rationalization of corporate tax incentives, this is one of the key areas that, are, that we've looked at. This is an example of what has been recently announced in the Prime Minister's uh, the, the 2012 budget. We, for the income tax exemption, instead of 100%, it's been reduced to 70% for tax, uh, step down for uh, the uh, exemption for shipping income. And our estimated revenue for next year from this alone is 127.8 million ringgit. Value management, and our attempt is to introduce value management in government procurement and both services and, and materials purchases so that we can get the 10% savings and that hopefully will be derived in the, in the course of next year. And this is one of the things that has begun to be implemented in the light of the recommendation of the uh, 51 policy measures. This is another example of business process re-engineering so that the public service delivery system is lean and efficient. We have reduced under uh, Pemuda. Pemuda have helped us to reduce, together with Mampu, uh, reduce the number of business licenses by 52% from 637 licenses required to 307 licenses in, in terms of ease of doing business in Malaysia. Uh, improve public service delivery to real-time performance monitoring and counter rating system some of you may have heard me talk about this. We have begun to introduce for a few balai police in Selangor, selected before. That means if you go to a balai police that are doing this, if you like the services rendered, you give them a score of 10. If you don't like it, you give them one. And so that is a score that you grant. And I think if you don't, you're worried that you might grant it, then you can also do it by SMS. You go back and then put the, the actual uh, what's the, uh, where did you put, and you can do this. So that trial that we did for a few had worked. So we have now implemented it for the whole of the police, all Balai police within Selangor. And so we'll see how that works. And if it works, we will then move it across the country. We got inspired by looking at what they do in China. Some of you may have gone to China on a business trip. If you stand there at the, at the immigration counter, the lady or the guy that's servicing you is looking very hard at whether you're going to press 10 or 1. Because the, the person that provides the service is rated on the basis of the score that's granted. And so that's how we're doing this. <coughs> so I think if this works, there's a tremendous opportunity to apply this into most counters uh, within the government service. Let me talk about human capital dynamics, some of the things that we're working on under the 51 policy measures. Minimum wage. Uh, the National Wage Consultative Council bill has been passed in Parliament, so that's in July. And um, we also partnership with industry. Uh, the National Talent Enhancement Program, the NTEP, essentially this is about uh, collaboration between the institutes that provide learning and courses, and then giving placement for many of them in companies. Altogether, 550 people, participants who are on those courses, I have now been placed in, uh, in many, many companies in covering five regions across the country. And upskilling and uh, multi-skilling, this is a My Pro Cert certification program. So if you are doing a particular course or vocational in a particular area, in such as SAP or what have you, and if you're proficient in doing it, you will then be granted this My Pro Cert. And this is actually, we launched that in October 11. And the reason being, you want quality. There are more than 100 technical and vocational training institutions in the country on varying quality. You know, the, the view about having a my pro is that when you have this, it's a stem of ultimate quality. 
and that's why that's there to, again, to increase competitiveness. The Employment Act 1955, a lot of changes are being looked at. We looked at them in the lab, and we have passed in Parliament a lot of changes uh, that, uh, that uh, we want to make, and this has been passed on the 6th of October. And with regards to minimum retirement age, extending it beyond 55, and the first reading in, in Parliament hopefully will be tabled soon, and so that will help us to move forward. These are no, by no means completed, but there are a lot more things we're doing. I'm just giving a snapshot of some of the things we're doing to move the pieces forward. And I just want to make a comment that the reason why I talk a little bit more about the SRI is simply because there are a lot of people that criticize the ETP for being very much project-related rather than capturing the strategic reform initiative. So rest assured, there are many, many things in the strategic reform initiatives that are being tracked, and I'm just giving some examples of them. Uh, let me then cover the national key economic areas implementation in action, what's been some of the things happening. You've seen on some of the videos, many of them, and I'm highlighting some that are not in the video, uh, this, the Johor Premium Outlet is 95% completed, and uh, this, what you see here is actually the actual building. It will be, uh, the opening ceremony is on the 11th of uh, December. If you want to buy some material from uh, items from designer uh, brands, you could go there uh, and, and, and you buy many of them. I think what they do is some of you may have been to uh, Woodbury Commons in New York. Very similar idea. Some overrun items and off-season items are sold at really very competitive and good prices. That's what you're, you're getting out there from doing this. Oil and gas, the Pengarang Independent Petroleum Terminal have started on the 1st of October. It's due to be completed uh, in December 2013. These are actual physical work that are done on the ground, physically done in, in, in Pengarang. The global incentive for trading has been launched. In fact, yesterday, the license was granted to five uh, companies that are going to be active in trading. Clearly for us, when you look into the future, by the year 2017, the uh, Wood McKinsey report together with Petronas suggests that Southeast Asia will be short of gas. If you take committed demand sale, including to countries such as Japan and others and domestic demand for Southeast Asia, there is going to be a shortage of natural gas. And so, of course, natural gas will have to be imported. We are building our own terminal in uh, Malacca, which hopefully will be operational in uh, August next year. In fact, uh, <coughs> Indonesia is building their own regas terminal. I think 8 million tons, I was 3.8 million tons. Uh, Singapore is building their, their own, I think about 3 million tons. Philippines is building their own. Clearly, everybody is importing a lot of gas. Our view today is that there's going to be a big market for trading, and for oil trading and gas trading. And so we're creating the conditions for a trading activity, a hub to take place in, in Johor, in, in, in Pangarang. And that's why the gift is put out there, because we see an opportunity emerging in the oil and gas business for this to happen. Next slide. Um, the, this is the UCSI Premium Health Township in uh, Banda Spring Hill, uh, uh, Negri Sembilan. These are the physical construction that's happening there, next. And increase oil extraction. This is in the oil palm sector. You know, this is not a physical project. We've decided the most important thing that we have to do is to increase the yield, the extraction rate uh, for oil palm. And so we have ranked all the 186 mills in the country, and we put physically TUNAS offices and placed them in each of those mills so that every mill follow the MTOB best practices, every single one of them. And the good news is we've been tracking the performance of those mills that, that enhance, if you like, the oil extraction rate has improved from 19.7% in January 2011 to 20.54% in September. In fact, when you look at this, the total additional revenue that is generating is 2.2 billion ringgit increase in CPO production. You can see how important this is to make sure that the best practices are employed at every mill. And we're tracking them and we're ranking, ranking all the 186 mills are ranked from number one to number 186 mills on the basis of their uh, if you like, oil extraction rate. 
Um, the Strand Aerospace Malaysia, this is a center of excellence in PJ, created and fully, fully operational in the third quarter of this year. They've got contracts from uh, European companies, including Fertile Engineering in Germany and Spirit Aerospace in the UK. So this is a, a booming business. And the other one on wholesale and retail is a very simple thing. In the lab, we had uh, quite a lot of the big boys who are in the big box retail, such as Maidin, and such as Cafo and Tesco, we then said if we can modernize, help the mom and pop stores and do proper merchandising, help them with proper pricing, proper planogram. And then if they were to do that, we will increase the sales. So in the lab, with the help of Mayadin, we picked, I think, I can't remember, was it three stores, uh, Amir? Uh, three, yeah? We took three stores and his team went into the stores and sort of saying we rip it apart. La. We changed the entire thing using their, uh, the techniques that they use in terms of planogram, merchandising, pricing, and the whole look and feel in terms of retail visual imaging. And that has been done to revamp it. And during the lab, we found out that sales actually increased by something between 30% to 80% already then. So we then decided it was a great idea. So this year we targeted to implement this in 500 small retail shops. And I'm pleased to say that we've implemented this in 315 stores across the country. And the total income has been rising at, at 30 to 80%. And that's really we're tracking this on a daily basis. The beauty of this program is that the government does not give them grant. We say we don't give grant to these guys because if we give grant, and probably they wouldn't be interested in raising the revenue. So what we granted was, we gave them 60,000 ringgit as a soft loan, loan. So they have to pay the loan. So that means they have to put the money and make sure that 60,000 ringgit is spent on those things that really matter. Because the revenue that's generated must be enough for them to pay the eventual loan. So that's, therefore, when we started to do this, it was really quite difficult for us to convince them. Some of them didn't believe that this could be the case. Part of the reason why we struggled to bring the 500 numbers immediately is because convincing the guys that this work is quite an, not an easy thing to do because some of them have been doing their job for 20 years and asking questions, how sure are you? And we have to bring them. The first one we did was in Marlimau. And so the lady that, that has been doing this, and she, her income, I think, more than double. And so this is a program that is uh, working very well. Next one, agriculture. This one is in Gurun in Kedah, uh, the fragrant rice. And they, they, we put in this fragrant rice, and, uh, and that the planting has, has taken place. The first harvest will come in, in actually September. Anchor companies are there so that we do contract farming, and ho hopefully we will get a lot more hectares of planting. Next slide. Telepresence. This one is a telepresence exchange completed. Three sites for telepresence services are operational. Manara VADS, Manara TM, and PT VADS Indonesia. Service demo is already available. So you can go and rent it, and you can do direct connectivity uh, using this technology. Uh, QAV technologies. Essentially, all the LED, LED testing were done overseas before. We didn't have our own testing internally. So a company has now made this happen. So the first ANSEI certified facility outside the US. So we've now made it, it's now available in Bayan La Paz in Penang. So this is now operational. So instead of sending all of our LED for testing in the overseas labs, it's now done internally in Bayan La Paz in the facility here. By the way, the margin's very good. The clinical research center, Sinan Brahad, is a body that was set up to facilitate clinical trials in Malaysia. Altogether, 280 clinical trials had been completed, and, uh, and that's really good. Our, our total uh, for the target is 230, so we've surpassed the target, in fact, uh, by doing this. The total GNI created as a result of these trials is 58.2 million in GNI by May 2011. And so, Talent Corps, some people always ask the question, have we been successful? Uh, has Talent Corp been successful to lure some of the people that are out there? And uh, they have managed to convince 
and brought in altogether 450 Malaysians to return under the, the, what they call the returning expert program. So that's a very good start. The resident pass has been implemented and has more than 300 applicants approved since uh, April 2011. The bond transport program is in implementation and that, that's also there. That means uh, students who are JPS scholars, if they then move over and if we grant them to go somewhere else, we can transfer the bond uh, to GLCs, etc. The STAR program is scholarship talent attraction and retention program already launched in 2011. This is some of the things that they're doing under talent corps. Next. Let me talk about some of the things that has been happening on the ground to cause this to happen. Every month, we have a steering committee meeting led by a lead minister. We call the NKA steering committee meeting. There's an investment committee meeting that is bi-monthly, that is co-chaired by Tato Mustafa and myself. And so we go through all the investment numbers, we check them and we discuss them and that's putting focus on that. And every week, if there are problems that cannot be resolved at the National Key Economic Area Steering Committee, we then pass them to the Economic Council. The Prime Minister chair this meeting every Monday, starting at 9.30 to 12.30. So problems that cannot be resolved at ministerial level will then be brought up to the Economic Council. And then we have the ETP updates. By the end of this year, March next year, we'll write a report about what we've delivered and not yet delivered to and so that the public will become aware of what's happening. So that essentially, on every Friday, I get a BlackBerry report on a Friday, every Friday. And so all the KPIs that are green are numbered there, and the yellow are there, the reds are there, and the KPIs that have not started are also there in the progress report. So we don't just report the KPIs, we have narratives upon this. I was joking with my team, the reason why I want this on Friday is that if I see red color, I will send them an email to catch out the weekend. Lah. And so that's why I wanted it on Friday. But I always believe discipline of action is key, that you have to be relentless about doing this. I've said to many people before, what you expect, your staff may deliver. But what you inspect, I believe they will deliver. And so that's why the inspection comes through the BlackBerry messaging. And that's given to all the lead ministers. And so they all have access to this on a weekly basis. Next. Let me talk about some of the endorsement and validation. For what it's worth, the Nielsen Consumer Confidence Index shows that we have reached a four-year high this year in terms of Consumer Confidence Index. You know why this is important? Because 60% of our GDP is actually domestic consumption both private and public consumption. If there is no confidence, you don't consume, then 60% is gone. Lah. You know? So 30% of our GDP, if you look at the demand picture of GDP, so 60% is consumption, both private and public. 30% uh, is investment, and 10% thereabout is trade. Trade means export minus import. If you take a look at it from a demand perspective, of course, if you look at it from a supply perspective, you take a sectoral cut at the GDP. So it's very important to make sure that uh, consumption, the, consumer, the consumers remain optimistic about our market. Now based on the survey that was done by the Nielsen Consumer Index, the, the poll and surveyed 56 countries, uh, Malaysia is number 10 among all the 56 countries that are polled in terms of optimism. Next. Uh, FDI, a lot of people that want to know about FDI. Our FDI for the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year, it grew at 76%. So clearly, a lot of criticism about the dwindling FDI is now, we are now, we're stemming the tide here because it's now growing at 76% compared to previous year. Trade has grown at 7.9% and uh, compared to last year for the first half of this year, that is good too. So it's very strong growth in the first half. Now, let me talk about the World Bank report that has recently been released on doing business in Malaysia. So we have moved from rank number 23 to number 18. So that's a, an improvement. Areas where they have said Malaysia has improved a lot is the one-stop station for all registration and starting business and enforcing contracts and resolving insolvency, setting up dedicated commercial courts. 
According to them, we are ahead of Germany, ahead of Japan, ahead of Taiwan, ahead of Switzerland, ahead of Belgium, and ahead of France in terms of doing business. That's according to the World Bank report. Let me talk about the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum showed that we have improved our standing or ranking from number 26 to number 21. We are now number one out of the 143 countries uh, globally. We are number six in Asia Pacific, number two in ASEAN, second only to Singapore. And Malaysia scored 5.08 points out of a maximum seven compared to 4.88 last year. So that's a big improvement. According to them, and that's not me, we have overtaken UAE, we have overtaken New Zealand, South Korea, Luxembourg, and Israel. That's the World Economic Forum. So you gotta take these things with a pinch of salt. La. But that's their assessment, and if they say we are good, we're good. La. If they say sometimes you're bad, then you say well, you're not so good. La. <clears throat> Let me talk about, so to my mind, I hope I've given you enough uh, data points to suggest that we are okay, but let me remind ourselves, we're on the right trajectory. We have not reached Vision 2020. We've got a long way to go. To be clear, we need to keep the momentum going. We need to have the focus. We need to make sure the conditions are right and created for competitiveness to flourish. And so this is absolutely not a sprint. There is no one in government that's declaring victory here. We are simply saying we are on the right path and if we keep doing what we're doing today, we'll get to Vision 2020. And I'd like to close this session by quoting my favorite quote of all, Helen Keller. Keep your face to the sunshine and you will never see shadows. Thank you.